This is a, a great segue into what we'll talk about this morning. Thank you, Nancy. We can go back, we can go to my slides as well. Uh, um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. My name is Paul Singh. I am a glaucoma and segment surgeon out in uh, the United States in Chicago, and truly honored to be here with a fantastic panelist as well. In fact, we have some famous panelists. I was walking by one of the monuments there, and all of a sudden I saw this, you know, kind of billboard here with these three fine doctors up there. We have uh, Stefano Gandolfi from Italy, Gus Gazard from the UK, and Kirsten Gomez from, Dr. Kirsten Gomez from uh, Germany. So we are lucky to have some amazing panelists here talking to you about uh, direct SLT. We'll have some clinical experience uh, as well and look at some of the data behind it, uh, comparing it to uh, traditional SLT. And my, my goal this morning for me personally is to talk about kind of the, what's happening in glaucoma and the why. Why is there a need for SLT and why even earlier adoption and more prevalent adoption is, in my opinion, very important. You know, we hear this term interventional glaucoma a lot being, uh, being uh, promoted. And what does that mean? What does interventional mean? You know, it's not necessarily rushing to surgery. It's really about not having to choose. I always joke around that for so many years when I came out of fellowship, I always felt like I had to choose. I had to choose between if I want to have a, a patient who has a high quality of life and yet controlling IOP. I had, it was one or the other. You know, the other way to think about it is I felt, I felt like I had to choose between addressing compliance in one hand and trying to maintain high safety in the other. And I think now with interventional glaucoma, with all the different devices and MIGs and drug delivery we have, it, as well as SLT, we have the opportunity to address compliance, address IOP early on, as well as maintaining high safety and, and compliance. And that's really the heart, for me, the heart and soul of what interventional glaucoma means. Because at the end of the day, one of the most impactful, most difficult issues that we face in medical management of glaucoma is compliance. It is hard. I mean, you, I'm sure everybody here has seen this and has experienced how hard it is to deal with this and how much time we take to educate patients. And we still have poor compliance if you look at the data out there as well. And the question that I have is, you know, should st standard of care be drops? I mean, no drops, no doubt they work well. Absolutely, PGAs are still a great first line, but are they necessarily safer? And again, this is, these are extreme pictures, but no doubt we say, pa see patients with MGD, ocular surface disease, hyperemia, fat pad loss, all the other topical issues that we face with prostaglandins. And so qu the question is, really, is it safer than, than laser? You know, and I, th I think we underestimate, and personally in my clinic, I've tended to end underestimate the impact and the prevalence of ocular surface disease in my glaucoma patients. I mean, almost about 80 to 90% of my patients have a concomitant ocular surface disease. And by the way, I'm not sure if anybody heard of the Rattan filter, W-R-A-T-T-E-N. It's a filter I use all the time. And once I started using this filter, I was able to identify people who had significant ocular surface disease. This filter is a yellow filter that I have it on my slit lamp. You can get a f kind of freehand lens filter as well, but it highlights the ocular surface so well and how often that we miss ocular surface disease because we're not looking for it. And even a simple filter like this can help identify a lot of these patients with fluctuating vision, you know, kind of pain, tearing. Those are all symptoms that we have to be aware of. And what is the impact of one glaucoma drop? Here's an example of a patient where all we did is with SLT, we took away one drop, one PGA, and without doing any other dry eye treatment, on the left is pre and the post SLT on the right, and you see how much better the ocular surface in terms of staining is just by getting rid of that PGA. So I think there's such an impact that we can make for our patients by getting rid of that, that drop as well. And what is important when we talk about things like dry eye and compliance is that it can lead to fluctuating vision and compliance and dry eye are highly correlated. You know, Baduan showed us if we have a patient with concomitant ocular surface disease, we have a 30% reduction of compliance. That's pretty impressive, right? And why that's scary is because if you're compliant, non-compliant, it can cause potential for fluctuating vision. And so for me in my practice, what I, what's changed the most in terms of interventional glaucoma and kind of the way I think about glaucoma is when I define what is controlled glaucoma. For years I said, okay, if the fields are stable, if the optic nerve is stable and the pressures are where I want them to be, absolutely they're, they're controlled, no doubt. Still the most important part. But now in my chart and philosophically, I think about quality of life. What is the risk or what are the chances of my patient staying on that could be the paradigm or that treatment regimen long term? If they're not gonna stay on that regimen, or they have a low uh, ability to stay on that regimen, they're not controlled. And we do have a number of data sets, of course, the light trial, horizon trials. A lot of trials now have come out showing us independently that compliance can be a risk factor for progression. So if I have a patient on the right, 
coming in like that, no matter how good their fields are, how good their nerves look, how good their pressures are at that visit, this is a patient who's high has a high likelihood of being non-compliant or having poor compliance and likelihood of them progressing is higher than those other patients who maybe are more compliant potentially. So that's the philosophical difference and why, for me, I do everything I can to take control back to our hands, to now have to think about were they compliant? Because think about all the decisions we make. You put them on that PGA and they're progressing. Are they progressing because they were non-compliant? Or do they need lower pressures? Were they fluctuating because of lack of compliance? Inflammation, we don't know. And that uncertainty can be frustrating for us going forward as well. And so we have seen a shift in the UK, and Augusta's work and others have shown us that first-line treatment really is SLT. And in the UK, I know they have that as well for the NICE standards as well, and multiple other societies have come across and said, yes, SLT is a great first line. But the question is, in my opinion, and my question to you all, why is SLT not first line? Gus, quick question to you. Why do you think SLT is not first line for majority or half of our colleagues out there? Um, I think it's partly inertia. I think um, any change in practice is difficult. I think it's um, partly the influence of, of big pharma having pushed us in one particular direction for the last generation um, or two. So I think it's what we're also traditionally used to. Um, so we just stick it out. Yeah. Then on top of that, you've also got um, other influences from the patients. Uh, they associate laser and the term laser with scary, burning, blinding lasers. Um, they remember James Bond. So there's, an ed there's, there's, there's time taking for us to educate them into the fact that maybe laser is not quite such a scary thing. We're not cutting burning holes and things. We're just very gently using some focus light on the front of the eye. Um, and so therefore, sometimes it's their expectations as well. Very good points. And in fact, I'm going to go through that. I think, you know, it's a lot of it you said is how we discuss the laser. And, and for me, I'll tell you my, my, my spiel. <laughs> I tell patients all the time, this is a rejuvenation. I say to my patient, your eye is like a water balloon, and the eye makes fluid to keep the shape of that balloon. But it has to drain. Your drain inside the eye is not working, so we have a beam of light that can rejuvenate. Your own body is healing itself. If it doesn't work, we have drops, so I give them the option. And I say it is a laser, technically, but like a laser pointer, it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't cut or destroy, it stimulates. And that confidence and the description helps ease some of the patient's fears, as Gus was mentioning, about having a laser. Non-destructive, it can be repeated. That philosophy and that way of approaching it, I think can help, again, a lot of those patients who are nervous about it. I also think there's some other barriers to, I think, adopting, let's say, the traditional SLT. I think. Not, people are wondering, is it standard of care? My patients want drops. N not necessarily, at least in my experience. I think gonioscopy and the comfort level of gonioscopy, now this is a room that's different because we have glaucoma specialists, but I think in the area, in, in the comprehensive ophthalmologists, there is a hesitation to perform gonioscopy, let alone doing a laser and gonioscopy as well. And that could be an issue in, in the view, right? The view may be an issue for some. You may have PAS. Some doctors may not feel comfortable with the angle itself. The cornea may have some issues where it's hard to see through as well. And it even concerns just physically doing the procedure. I, I tell you, I, I have neck issues. I had neck surgery, ACDF surgery many years ago for uh, spinal stenosis from chronic use of lasers as well as, of course, genetics, no doubt. And so I think there's an issue. Here's my neck, by the way, that in the middle there's my spinal stenosis and I have a plate. That's my neck. So beware, everybody. All these lasers you're doing, you're like this. I have some, we'll talk later, but be careful because it, it is an issue. Spinal stenosis and surgery is a big issue as well. So I think there's a lot of barriers, and that's why the Belkin Vision uh, Eagle is such a, I think, a benefit to me and, and I think a change in the future, especially for adoption for those surgeons who aren't as comfortable. And what I'm gonna show you is a, a video kind of introducing you to this idea, this new technology of direct SLT, so not having to use a gonio prism to be able to apply laser energy externally. And what does that mean? Well, from efficiency, flow, comfort level of patients, and for the surgeon, there's some potential benefits as well. So it's an automated treatment, which makes it, I think, unique. It has an auto recognition of the limbus, and we'll show you a video on that as well. It allows you to customize the treatment with the number of shots and where you want to apply the shots as well. And it gives you about 120 laser shots to the external uh, limbus to allow us to excite the trabecular meshwork and the whole process as well. So again, just showing you again the idea, unlike a direct SLT, or rather a gonio lens, is directly applying to external limbus, getting through to the trabecular meshwork, and getting, causing the natural cytokine release and interleukins and all the other downward cascade that we see with SLT in general. 
And I'm going to show you a video to introduce us, and we'll move on to Gus here. This just kind of shows you what it's about. This is the Belkin Vision Eagle. It's, again, an automated system where the patient, like an OCT almost, puts their chin in a chin rest. The laser will recognize the limbus, and after you double-checking a couple of the parameters, it fires the laser, those 120 laser spots here in real time, and you're done. Uh, it has a safety check. If the patient moves, it'll shut off. And you can, again, mark specific areas where you don't want the laser to fire. So you have the ability to control, and that's pretty much it. So I think from an access, from a comfort level for the patient and the doctors, I think it's a, a very impressive uh, new technology. So with that intro, I, I want to hand it over to Gus, Gus Art, who's going to talk about some real life cases, and some, some data, and uh, hopefully I'll have some time later on, too, for some questions. So thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. So we got a... I think we'll get Gus's slides. There we go. And you're just on the mouse here, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, morning, everyone. It's pretty impressive to have such a um, show of attendance quite so early in the morning. I don't have the same excuse for being as tired as um, those guys coming from Chicago, but there we are. Um, I'm going to talk briefly a little about some intro into where we've come from, from the light trial, um, what that's shown us, um, why I think we should be using primary SLT for pretty much everyone with open angles, ocular hypertension, as the primary treatment, and the benefits that that generates per se. Then just briefly mention uh, a case that we can um, hang some of our thoughts on. And then covering a little bit of the data from the Glorious Trial, which will also be presented in the rapid fire um, later on today. But I realise that um, those very short three-minute um, presentations are not um, possible for everyone to get to. I do have some research funding acknowledgements, primarily from the um, National Institute of Health Research in the UK that funded the Light Trial, but then a number of other organisations to whom credit um, should be given. And then I have financial disclosures, which are available on the web over the last decade. So... The um, SLT um, versus MEDS trial within the LIGHT trial, with which you are likely to be familiar, um, really has put primary SLT as the initial starting point um, for our patient journey, um, right at the forefront of everything we do now. And I think for the majority of people, certainly everyone I'm seeing in clinic now, they are offered SLT, they're offered primary SLT, as the starting point, and I think the advantages of that are that we're catching them very early in the disease and very early on in their journey, and we're able to possibly divert uh, the course of that disease over the next, um, at least the next six years that we have trial results for, but possibly for longer. And what we saw, right jumping now to the six-year trial results, in two treatment arms that were comparing people starting their journey with SLT and those who started in the more traditional way of starting off with medications. Their six-year results, so at the three-year time point, we allowed patients to switch, if they were already on medications, we allowed them to switch over to the SLT arm. So in the SLT first group, we've got 70% of eyes still controlled at pre-specified eye-specific targets. So what we do in clinical practice, what we do in clinic, we take a, an eye, we make a judgment about the severity of their disease, we make a judgment based on their starting eyeball pressure, and then say, right, okay, where are we going to take you? Where do we think we need to get you down to? And then monitor them carefully. That's what we all do on a daily basis. And that's what we did in the trial, but in a formalized way with, with um, careful, defined algorithms so that we're the, we could remove bias from those judgments and we could do the same thing across all of our 718 patients. And then... Um, we treated to that target, and we found that 70% of those having SLT as their first treatment were still controlled without any medications at all, right out to six years. Now, a, a significant proportion of those were controlled with just one laser. So this idea that laser um, will only have a certain um, reduction or will only have a certain period or duration of action clearly isn't the case if you're doing it as your first starting treatment and looking prospectively. There are supposed data out there suggesting that perhaps it's not as good in the real world. The problem with those is they're all retrospective and they were done on the wrong eyes. This is a very specific sort of new starting point for where we should be going with our um, newly diagnosed patients. And then in the drops first group, we had a proportion of those that were also drop free. They were all the ones that crossed over to have laser. So even after you've had three years of medication, 
There's good evidence now, and we've got the crossover st um, study looking at those patients. There's good evidence that even if you've had pre-existing medication, that having laser can get you off drops in a significant proportion and give you good disease control. But good disease control is nothing if it doesn't translate into protection from vision loss. Good pressure control needs to translate into something more than that for our quality of life for our patients. Um, and what we found was that those who started with their medication had, as Paul alluded to, um, worse outcomes. So they had more disease progression, they required more surgery, and also more cataract surgeries as it happened. But they had less good control and preservation of their visual fields, less good control of their, their disease over that, that first initial three years until the drops, could, drops group could have their laser. But then right out the way three to six years, that carried on going. So that divergence carried on after people in the drops group were allowed to have lasers. So that suggests that catching them early, starting, off on them, starting them off on that one track, that effect may carry on going throughout the course of their disease. And it might well carry on going beyond that six years. Because remember, we had 70% of eyes controlled with, and half of those with just one laser. They can still have more laser later on. So maybe we've got this holy grail of, of really, um, as Paul describes it, rejuvenating their trabecular mesh work um, and stimulating some changes that capture um, uh, and um, help that trabecular mesh work to carry on functioning better for a longer time, long period of time. I think what's exciting about this new development is the possibility that we may be able to deliver that stimulus to the trabecular meshwork cells, um, probably to, probably to the um, trabecular meshwork um, stem cell nests that we know um, reside near Schwarm's, Schwarm's line, um, and the, stimulate the division and the repopulation of trabecular meshwork um, by that. We can deliver energy to that area in various different ways. So if we can deliver that transclerally with direct SLT, then we may be able to do that without the need for um, gonia prisms, without the need for um, gonioscopy, without the whole um, complexity, difficulty, um, inconvenience, and, and also, let's face it, skill set required in order to deliver laser directly through a gonia lens. We can just go direct through the tissues. To examine whether that would work or not, the Eagle, um, the Glorious trial using the Eagle laser, um, using very, very similar energy settings to standard laser, but delivered through a different route, uh, randomized two different, uh, to two different um, treatment arms. One was the direct SLT, and one was traditional SLT, and um, had washout pressures at baseline and washout pressures at six months, and then analysis of treated pressures out to a year. The results of that, uh, the ones that I'm presenting later on today, show that the primary outcome of washed out pressure reduction was not significantly different between the two treatment arms. So you're getting a very comparable pressure reduction in those two groups. Now these weren't um, purely primary um, treatments. These included patients who were on multiple medications who had come to us, um, were then washed out, as well as some patients who came to us on no medications at all, similar to the light trial group. So it's a slightly different group of patients. We had slightly more um, severe disease in terms of prior treatment requirements. So it's not exactly comparable in terms of um, the starting pressures, but there was no difference between the two, no significant difference between the two treatment arms. Um, so I'm just going to really finish with just with a very simple case, which is um, a guy presented with floaters and raised pressures. He had wide open angles. He was a low myope. Very early retinal nerve fiber layer loss and really pretty well preserved visual fields. Very straightforward. The sort of thing that previously would have started with a prostaglandin and had, had lifelong treatment. Um, pretty mild disease. He's, he's very much at the beginning of his journey. He's, he's, he was at that stage younger than I am now, so feels like hopefully reasonably young, um, and he treated and he got down at his one-month pressures were really pretty well controlled. His visual fields remained stable over the next few years. He was part of one of the early um, patients treated because he was part of the trial, and very similar sorts of um, experience and responses you're getting and we were seeing in the light trial. This fits with the response rates that we got in the Gloria study for the proportions of patients who were drop-free when you look at them by medication burden. So if you look at the ones that are requiring more meds um, before their washout to control their pressures before they were recruited, we see that, not surprisingly, a lower proportion of those become completely drop free at the end of it. But a significant proportion of those who were medicated at screening 
were still um, drop-free pressure control out to the end of the trial. So we're obviously getting quite a wide range of degrees of control, um, both with SLT and direct SLT, um, but we're getting more drop-free pressure control on patients who are starting off with a less intensive drop burden, as I think you'd expect um, and um, as we saw very much in the light trial. So a new way of delivering laser to this target tissue, um, the same kind of laser, the same kinds of effects and energy density um, from the energy modelling that we've done, um, looking at the energy um, fluence, the laser density and energy density at that trabecular meshwork to stimulate probably um, stem cell division and repopulation of the trabecular meshwork, but done in a way that, as you've heard from Paul, much um, more straightforward and much more rapid, that in itself, I think, will allow a lot of patients greater access around the world to um, an SLT at the beginning of their process. Um, looking forward to the publishing the results of the trial so that it can undergo um, wider scrutiny. And on that, I will hand over to Paul for questions. Thank you so much. That's great. Let's see if it's on here. Let me go back. Check. We'll go back up here. Uh, before we uh, call Stefano up here, um, one question for you, Gus. What's the impact of earlier disease, earlier uh, addressing the disease earlier than the disease state? In other words, the conventional pathway, you know, canal, the distal collector channels, do you think there's a benefit or do you think there's an importance that we don't wait for in terms of efficacy and outcomes of SLT, doing it earlier versus later? I think by treating earlier, we definitely have um, a chance to intervene before the meshwork has become progressively more damaged by the normal disease process. And there is also an additional concern that traditional um, polypharmacy for many years that we know damages um, conjunctival tissues, we know causes chronic inflammatory processes in the conjunctiva that we worry about for later surgical success. There's also a worry that something similar may well be going on in the trabecular meshwork. So I think that um, this becomes more speculative because there's less histological data, uh, data available. But I, I do wonder whether years of pharmacological exposure of trabecular meshwork, particularly if it's preserved, causes progressive damage to the TM. And so we may, in fact, and there is a, there's a whole um, theory around uh, back-induced TM um, damage that we may, in fact, be making them worse. And the ever-escalating requirement for um, further treatment is not just about um, the natural disease process, but is an exacerbation caused by some of our um, therapies themselves. So by taking that out of the equation, starting off with laser earlier, we may be able to divert them away from that cascade of um, ever-increasing pressures um, and catch it when it's still able to, well, in your words, rejuvenate. Yeah. No, I think it's important, too, in the context also of MIGS, I personally, my personal opinion is sure. if we can rejuvenate, enhance alpha to TM, are we maintaining canal, like you said, maintain the canal dilation or canal patency, rather? So for our future MIGS procedures, theoretically, do we have a better chance of them being more successful? Now, data's not out there yet, but that's my personal thought. And, you know, that's, I'm agreeing with you. Ten years ago, I would probably do the same thing. PGAs, have, you know, most likely uh, what I would start it with as well. Uh, so I think we're seeing a transition. And now, in my practice, uh, absolutely, this would be an SLT or DSLT patient for sure, no doubt. I think for the sake of time, let's go to the slides. We'll, we'll call up our good friend here, Stefano Gandolfi, who I'm so honored to have him come up here and, and give his uh, talk as well. So thank you for that, Gus, and we'll move forward with uh, Dr. Gandolfi. Thank you. Thank you. And here we are, going back to the real world data and real world patients. Actually, we have, been, we have had the technology available in our, in our department for, for a bunch of months. And we collected a decent number of patients uh, that we schedule uh, to this kind of treatment. Actually, laser treatment first uh, has been very popular in our department since the last, let's say, 15 to 20 years. And that's the reason why actually we, uh, we have been offering SLTs, a primary treatment, as long as in the, in the, at the beginning of the year 2000, so that it means almost 20 years ago. So, and here, having this technology, it was very easy for uh, both for ourselves and for the patients that are routinely scheduled to be referred to our department to have uh, laser first 
or to be offered, or laser to be offered, let's say, as a good alternative to what they are experiencing in terms of medical therapy. And here, my disclosure. Uh, and let's start with the first, uh, with the first case. Um, this is a male, 80 years old, uh, showing up with ocular hypertension, with, uh, ranging between 23 and 25 millimeters of mercury, the diagnosis. In 2013, he had a phaco in both eyes with a good reduction of pressure, as it happens to be usually when you have ocular hypertensive patients, and uh, they are, even if the angle is wide open. In 2015, he experienced an unfortunate retinal detachment that actually uh, went uneventfully uh, by a, 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 with, a, with a good pass plan of vitrectomy and addition of uh, silicone oil. Uh, actually, the break were inferior, uh, and this forced the surgeon just to use the density on, let's say, the, the dense PDMS in order to, to have a good tamponade inferior. In March 2022, uh, clearly, silicone was removed later on. In March 2022, in both eyes, the pressure was 24, 25 millimeters of mercury, and it started, was started on, on treatment with a fixed combo of beta blocker and topical uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And uh, then uh, it came to our, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to our department, having a pressure of 21, 22 millimeters of mercury in treatment, and it was slightly poor, not that terribly tolerant to the treatment, and we planned a, a, a DSLT on both eyes. And this actually, this is the expert on gonioscopy. Uh, let's say the angle came out to be wide open, it was pseudo fakey, but, there were some remnants, as you can clearly see here, at the six o'clock hours of Densiron, of dense PDMS in the anterior chamber, and the bubbles are clearly visible here, and then are even more visible on gonioscopy in the upper, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, by, via the gonio lens. And that's a typical patient where I would dare, I would not dare to deliver energy uh, uh, via, let's say, an, by an anterior approach, because you never know what's happening to the tissue and to the interface there. So I would be extremely reluctant to plan an SLT on this patient. Well, actually, we planned a DSLT according to a diffusion of energy via transcleral approach. And uh, uh, a DSLT at 360 degrees was planned on the right eye. And it was planned in 180 degrees DSLT in the superior part of the angle, since the technology can offer you the possibility and the luxury to select uh, the areas where you want to apply energy and the spots directly on the sclera. And it came out that 30 minutes later, the pressure was dropping down to 11 millimeters of mercury in the right eye and the 15 on, on the left eye, that remember was the eye with the, with the silicone oil bubbles in the anterior chamber. And we had, an, a, let's say, a, um, in, some cell reactions in the anterior chamber they were, and a diffuse punctate keratopathy. Uh, with lubricant and the clofenac, the patient was dismissed in both eyes. One week later, clearly the inflammation was clearly over and the pressure was 18 millimeters of mercury in the right eye, 21 millimeters of mercury in the left eye, no inflammation at all. Uh, two months down the line, the pressure, as it always happens when you uh, when you apply energy and you are looking for a biological effect, and we know by our SL, previous SLT experiences, it takes some time to SLT to build up uh, an effect. Well, the pressure was 14 in the right eye and 16 in the left eye with no inflammation at all. And that was actually a phenotype where having that, uh, let's say, physical obstacle in the anterior chamber, uh, uh, we might have been extremely reluctant to use traditional SLT approach. And this is another, this is a second case coming from real life. Uh, this male is slightly younger, let's say from 80 to 72 years old. Uh, uh, in 2017, referred for primary ankle closure glaucoma, and it was already on treatment at that time with a fixed combo of pizza blocker and topical uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor together with a PGA, with a prostaglandin analog that at that time it was matoprost. Uh, it was offered in 2018 at uh, uh, LPI, uh, laser iridotomy in both eyes, and then in 2021, uh, he finally developed a cataract which allowed us to, uh, to take the lens out uh, and to be more comfortable, and he did a FACO. 
uh, and it, uh, it fell back in March 2023 with a pressure of 17 on, in the right eye, the pressure of 18 in the left eye. It was a maximally tolerated medical therapy, and it came out with uh, still some synechia in the right eye, and some, let's say 180 degrees of synechia that were not continuously, they were not continuous synechia, they were patchy like. Uh, Why there were no PAS in the left eye? The big, the, let's say the big issue in this patient was actually adherence and compliance and tolerability to therapy, as you were highlighting before. This patient was 100% intolerant to any sort of eye drop. Uh, so he was extremely happy uh, to have a, a DS, a DSLT planned in both eyes. And uh, this was the aspect of the anterior chamber angle. You can see the, uh, on, let's say, very, uh, uh, on the right hand side, with respect, well, the, the picture is not that terribly nice, it's much better on the computer. You can see the synechia building up on the right part. Uh, well, here the, the angle is, uh, is definitely accessible. And here again, you can see some synechia on the on the lower uh, on, on the right hand side. And here in the 3D uh, image coming after the after the casia, uh, again you can see on the right hand side a, a synechia, uh, let's say closing the angle, while the rest of the angle was apparently open. A DSLT uh, was planned in the right eye, uh, and uh, uh, even if the technology. Uh, is excellent in offering you the possibility to, to deliver the energy uh, to, the, to a tissue uh, all, let's say, in conditions where you can't, you could not go uh, via an anterior approach, let's say when you got the angle which is narrow or close. Uh, anyway, here we just decided to select the area uh, that were virtually free of synechia uh, in order, let's say, to have a much safer approach while other, but nevertheless, we might have, have let's say delivered, a 360 overall, uh, no matter of the, uh, of the area that were closed. Uh, on the left hand side, in the left eye, we planned the conventional 360 degrees. And it ended up, the 30 minutes later, again, the pressure was nine in the, uh, on the right eye, eight in the left eye, again, with some mild, uh, with some mild inflammatory reaction in the ticket chamber, again, treated with lubricant and the non-steroidal uh, eye drops in both sides, and one week later, uh, clearly the inflammation was, was over, and the pressure was extremely interestingly low, with 10 millimeters of mercury on the right eye, and, and again, the, the same value on the left eye, and at that time it was on brinzolamide. Uh, it was the only drug that he was able to tolerate. When he showed up two months later, uh, uh, actually uh, he, uh, uh, he had spontaneously uh, quitted the therapy because of, again, of in, being intolerant to brinzolamide too. And it ended up with no therapy at all, with 15 millimeters of mercury on the right eye, 16 in the left eye. So this was a typical patient there where you can't give anything else but distilled water, that this is the only liquid that the surface of the eye can tolerate. And then using this technology, even in narrow angle or where the angle can, might be approached with some, uh, let's say, uh, uncomfortability by an anterior uh, by an anterior view, here we were able just to, uh, to put the, the patient on a, in a safety zone. So this was actually the feedback that we, uh, that actually we had after having started using the technology. Uh, that clearly the technology offers a significant drop in intraocular pressure. And if I can speak out a very uh, epidermical feeling, we have been using low power SLT for ages. Remember, we have our protocol, which is, the, let's say, delivering every year uh, a low amount of energy, uh, low power energy SLT to the patients, no matter uh, of the control of intraocular pressure, just to reprime the system. It's like to reboost the system. And uh, we had the feeling that with this technology and with this platform, the amount of pressure drop is slightly higher, or at least in the, in the short to mid follow-up, the mid-term, is slightly greater than the uh, low power SLT is, uh, is offering. But this is really, uh, uh, um, let's say, an, an eminence-based medicine. It's just a matter of a, a uh, let's say, per personal feeling. Uh, we had, a, uh, virtually in the vast majority of the patients, we had a short-term inflammation, short-term inflammatory reactions, then went over, uh, let's say, in an oven, slightly in an overnight, uh, with a mild and short course of non-steroidal, so actually no worry, and is 
came out to be feasible in closed or narrow angle, uh, which makes unfortunately, which is unfortunately the, the Achilles heel of the, of the conventional SLT. But that's a phenotype where you can't plan an SLT unless you do something to widen up the angle. And uh, the, the question for ourselves, having had the technology not that long enough, is the repeatability which is offered, and uh, uh, clearly it, it can be a pro. Uh, we didn't experience the possibility of repeating the treatment, but this is something that we have in the box available uh, in the long run. And uh, uh, working in a public system, um, clearly sustainability and affordability from the economical point of view might be an issue because uh, the treatment uh, is charged with a, with a cost per procedure. And according to what is your uh, personal setting uh, within your professional activity, uh, it, might, it could be an issue if you are not uh, cashed back per procedure by the system you're working for. Uh, and this is actually a, a, the, the final question mark for a technology that, at least to ourselves, uh, came out to be extremely promising and to widen the indications for laser tuberculoplasty, for laser treatment as a first line in our patients. And that's it. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation, Doctor. I appreciate that. Um, I, exciting to have the access to patients who have narrow angles, PAS, other issues that we normally can't access with uh, traditional SLT as well. And sounds like the inflammation is no different than traditional SLT. Pretty much the same amount of inflammation, would you say? Uh, you mean about for, for SLT versus direct, the inflammation in the anterior chamber fairly similar? Well, I, I, I tell you, the, 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 our idea concerning the, the, the origin of the inflammation is just that we have uh, a mild iritis. Actually, we're using a fixed power, and we just decided to use that fixed amount of energy to, to deliver. And it might be that uh, either just by lowering the amount of energy or, uh, let's say, selecting patients with a with, with a wider angle, that inflammation clearly should be by far mildly. But anyhow, uh, it was a reaction that went over uh, in an eye blink. So th this, is not, this is nothing that is really worrying. Nothing comparable to the inflammatory reaction that we were experiencing using the argon laser tuberculoplasty a long time ago. Uh, so this is something that really, uh, clinically speaking, is very poorly significant. Excellent. But it happened, so yeah. we need to know that. Natural. Thank you for that. For the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. I know we're getting, we want to make sure you get you all out on time as well. So I'm going to have uh, Dr. Kirsten Gomez come up here and share. They've had, I think, over 300 cases already, so one of the earliest adopters of this new technology. So thank you. Thank you. So good morning. It's really great to be here together with all of you. I'm to share our first feedback and personal experience, real world life data. Um, we had the great privilege to be one of the first in Europe and worldwide to have this direct SLT. And we've been performing for six months about um, uh, treating um, patients. Um, we have about around 300 patients. So about as many patients as um, people are sitting in the auditorium, or were planned to sit in the auditorium, 300. And yes, so um, in the University Eye Hospital of Bochum, we um, really did quite a few um, nice things. And the glaucoma management, um, um, we really have lots of challenges in glaucoma management. First of all, the demographic development. We have a number of people over 60 years and worldwide. So in 2050, we will have more than 2 billion of people um, older than 60 years. And so this means or leads to an increase of the worldwide number of glaucoma patients. In 2026, we will have over maybe 160 million people, uh, glaucoma patients that we have to treat and that require treatment and that we have to care about. And we all know the classical traditional way of therapy with eye drops, we have lots of compliance problems. We have side effects, we have allergies, intolerances. Some patients don't know how to apply the eye drops correctly. Some patients forget them and some 
patients don't take them at all. And so in glaucoma therapy, we will probably see a change in the roadmap because the cl classical traditional model in Europe, it looked like this. We take eye drops, meds, a long time, up to four eye drops, and then if the IUP is not regulated or if the eye drops are not efficient, sufficient, then we do an intervention. But the upcoming model will look like this, we will do the intervention much earlier. And um, we have therapy, minimal invasive, to do this, the mix and SLT. So where's the indications of SLT? We've heard that already, based on the light trial study um, in the Lancet or in the Europea, European Glaucoma Society guidelines. DSLT is really acknowledged as initial first-line therapy instead of eye drops and also as additional therapy in patients next to eye drops and after surgeries. This, is, um, just, this gives an overview of um, the broad spectrum of glaucoma therapy options that we have. And um, I just wanted to show you where SLT is located here. We have the up external um, surgeries and the up internal surgeries. And SLT is located here and the up internal minimal invasive um, things in the, with the trabecular outflow. Yes, and where's DSLT located? If you look at it across the therapy spectrum regarding IUP reduction and the risk level effect. Um, of course, SLT does not have, this is a graph by Eike Ahmed, does not have the IUP reduction of traps and shunts, it can't have, but these have much bigger risk levels. And um, of course, also bigger than the mix in the medium. SLT, the IP reduction is not as big as the traps and the mix, but the risk level is lower. So we have lots of challenges in glaucoma management. Many patients are not detected with glaucoma. We have progression despite target goal, but we have some challenges in glaucoma where DSLT can help us. Um, I have brought for you a, um, a special menu of cases across the treatment spectrum, so real world cases. This special DSLT menu of cases, I have as an aperitif, as a first dish, um, a first case DSLT as first line therapy. Then as main dish, I have a case DSLT as additional or adjunctive therapy um, to eye drops. So in a patient where we have to bridge the time or the interval to surgery. And then as third, as dessert, we have one last case where the patient already has all therapeutic options and um, his refractory and we are trying to see if we can find something to do or to help. So the patient, um, the first patient, um, the first case, is a 28-year young patient. He's very active in sports and traveling. And he, is a, um, he has no meds so far. He's untreated. And he has um, high IOP um, fluctuations, high levels of IOP. And his biggest wish is to stay independent of eye drops as long as possible. And so we decided to give him DSLT as first line therapy. And he's really happy because in follow ups, the levels were down more to the teens, 15 to 17. He had less peaks and um, he's independent of drops for the time being. We will have to control to see how long the effect stays, but for the time being, um, we have a very good option for this young person. Then I have, this is the second case, a more early and moderate glaucoma patient, 15 year, 50 year old. Um, he has to take three conservative free eye drops, but um, beta blockers are contraindicated because he has asthma and he doesn't tolerate eye drops very well. And the target IUP under 15 to 16 is not always reached. So what shall we do? Um, the patient, normally we would say, okay, we have to um, indicate a surgery for him. 
but the patient does not have time for surgery and um, due to private and job reasons. So we had the idea to give him DSLT as a kind of bridge, as a bridging system to fill in the gap or the time interval until the surgery. And his IOPs before DSLT were around 17 to 22, with a target goal under 16, and the IOP after DSLT was 14 to 16, so it was lower. And we did some 24-hour IOP measurements four months after DSLT, and we had some lower values, but he doesn't always reach the target goal, so he will have surgery maybe um, in the near future, but for the time being, we did something to get him down a little bit before that. The third case is a um, glaucoma patient, very advanced. You see the optic nerve, you see the visual fields. We only have little rest visual fields left. And this patient already had all surgeries, you can imagine, the traps, revisions, microstands, cyclophotocoagulation. He's still on a maximum of meds and eye drops and systemically, and the target goal is of course under 12, it's not reached. And this patient doesn't wish any further surgery. He has general health problems. And so he came up to us and said, look, I've heard about your DSLT in the um, health journal or in the internet. I would love to have the DSLT. We said we don't expect that there are many effects but we tried it, and um, he's a very nice patient. He, has, um, he does regular IOP measurements at home with eye care, and some patients, they give me Excel tables with their IOPs, and this patient did it in handwriting. He measured after the laser every three hours, and what we saw is that the level before was around 12 to 18, and after the first day, it was still up, 18 to 21. We had a little peak. But after the first days, we did have a really drop down to 6 to 12 millimeter mercury for two to three months, and we are still observing him. We don't know how long this will stay this way. He's still taking all the drops, but he has um, his level down, and he was, of course, very happy. So the quality of life outcome was patient is happy for a certain time interval, Peaks may occur directly after the laser therapy, so that's why we measure after one hour and also after one day to, to um, see that everything is okay. And what is interesting in this case is also the individualized therapy um, option um, because you could adjust the DSLT and spare the blab and the micro stand and just laser the rest. And now I have a last photo case of a very special patient. He had really back problems and neck problems, Bechtarev. And um, here you see me in Corona times with mask and <laughs> everything. But I was trying to support him because we could do a DSL treatment um, with him standing up and because he only had to be at the chin rest for three seconds. That's the time of the treatment. Um, duration, 2.4 seconds. And treatment in these patients is always hard um, if you want to do a surgery or whatever. So DSLT was, a, was an option. So my last slide, sorry, show, will show the feedback of our patients and from us, from our doctors regarding SLT. So what do our patients say to DSLT? Also I asked them or interviewed them and said, okay, how do you like DSLT? And they said, well, they like it because it's in a comfortable setting, not in the surgery room. Then early, only eye drops as local anesthesia and it's contact free, no gonial lens. They don't have to, uh, we don't have to take this. And the treatment is only seconds, 2.3 seconds. And if we say, okay, in the, scala of zero to 10 of discomfort, where do you see yourself? And they say, well, somewhere between, some say zero, but some say zero to three. So it's mild and short-term discomfort of a few seconds. And it's fast, immediate recovery, and we can treat both eyes in one visit because we have low risk compared to other treatments, and patients don't have to stop anticoagulation meds 
if um, they take them. So in the whole, the patients have quality of life improved with less eye drops or without the side effects of some eye drops. And so for it, um, we will follow them up to see how long this effect will be there because um, we're collecting this da data and to see how in the real world, not only in the study setting, um, the people will have a good effect and also not only first line therapy patients, but also patients who have more advanced or moderate glaucoma. And this is the last slide. How is the DSLT as therapy option from the doctor's feedback, from the doctor's side? Well, I'm happy that we can acknowledge it, the DSLT as initial primary therapy plus as additional or adjunctant therapy. We always have to take into account that the effect and the duration of the IOP is, of course, vary individually. But what is great is we have eye tracking, automatic recognition of the limbus, 120 effects in three seconds, which is really fast. We can treat, uh, the treatment is repeatable. The workflow is, of course, increased, and we can cut down the waiting time for the rising number of patients. And future glaucoma surgeries following are still possible and not blocked. So, in the whole, we have an improvement of IOP and compliance, additionally, for a certain time. Thank you. Oh, no, no, thank you. Sorry. Fantastic. Um, while we're putting the Slido questions up again here, oh, we got the advantages up there already. Wonderful. Um, we're going to talk about that. A real quick question. You, you, your practice didn't do SLT before the uh, DST, is that correct? So how is this real quick? We didn't do SLT before. We directly went to the direct SLT. So yes. how was that, real quick here for the sake of time, but how was that transition from not doing any SLT all to this, was it easier for the staff and for you to have that discussion with patients, was it? it well, we had to organize it a little bit, uh, but um, now the workflow is um, pretty quick, so we can really offer it to them right away when they come to the glaucoma um, session and they need it, they can get it right away. So it's um, straightforward. Fantastic. So, you know, with these results we're seeing here, what you, in your opinion, what is, what is probably the biggest benefit you found with the new Belkin Vision Eagle? Well, clear, it's clearly faster in terms of, let's say, uh, workflow. Uh, you're treating both eyes very quickly, and uh, you don't need, at the end of the day, uh, a, a very, an extremely careful gonioscopy beforehand, because it's easier, to say, uh, it's user-friendly. Um, so to me, it's one step forward, and particularly it increases the, the phenotype, the, phen the number of phenotypes that you can offer, uh, laser technology, laser treatment technology, just by uh, approaching narrow angles. So to me, it's, it's one step forward, and it's very clear. Yeah, I mean, Gus, last question to you. I mean, do you feel like this is going to change the paradigm of patients or doctors accepting SLT as first line in general? I think it'll be, certainly be a big step towards um, a much greater acceptance and uptake of um, both primary and repeat treatment because I think it will be a lower barrier to entry into SLT in general, as you've heard from Inga. Um, and also, I think it will be more acceptable to the patient, so yeah. Do you, and last question too to you is, do you, do you feel, any one of you feel like there's a need to do direct and do traditional SLT with Goni, or if you have this, just do all the patients this way? I mean, or, would you, or would you go back and forth between the two different types of SLT? Any reason to? Anyone else? No, not sure. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. I'm just curious. That's a good question. Um, I, I don't imagine that one would need to do so. I can't think of a, a situation where you would need to flip back and forth. I think you could probably just do one. But since the um, mechanism. mechanism and delivery of energy to the target tissues is, is a different route, but the same underlying principle. Fantastic. Well, I, I know we went a little over, so thank you, everybody, for staying with us to past 8.30. So I hope this was informative. Have a wonderful meeting, and thank you to our panelists. Fantastic presentations. Have a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you to Belkin.